Does anybody wish to resign? Hmm? It was a late 90s movie adaptation of the quirky and stylish 1960s British TV series that tried to remain a faithful adaptation, yet at the same time appealed to contemporary audiences. In the end, it was like trying to teach a parrot to process uranium. It did not turn out at all well. The Avengers. There's always a yearning for a return to something that you remembered fondly from years ago. Sometimes bringing things back doesn't work out all that well. Like the time you performed a black magic ritual to bring back the lifeless corpse of Richard Burton, but he flat out refused to recite the prologue to War of the Worlds until you discussed payment with his agent, and so you have to reanimate him next, who likewise won't budge until you bring back his mother, and then pretty soon you have a living room full of reanimated undead. Meanwhile, zombie Richard Burton has passed out after emptying the contents of your liquor cabinet. It's odd. Rusty, perhaps? If I haven't lost the knack. If you're wondering why this review has been released before we covered the earlier series, that's because we did not want this not particularly well-reviewed movie to be our last taste of the Avengers franchise. We will be covering the other shows in other videos. Like spoons in a drawer. Perhaps I could help you if I knew what you wanted. The Avengers was a British TV series that ran from 1961 to 69 that followed the exploits of a pair of crime fighters. It started off as a show made in a multi-camera TV studio about Dr. David Keel teaming up with the shadowy government agent John Steed on a casual basis to bring ne'er-do-wells to justice, but it quickly morphed into something else. Original star Ian Hendry left after one season and Honor Blackman was cast as Steed's offsider Mrs. Kathy Gale. The teaming of a male spy with an ass-kicking female amateur proved to be a winning formula. The show's fourth season saw a glossy upgrade to being shot on film with an even bigger upgrade, Diana Rigg as Mrs. Emma Peel. Those two seasons with Mrs. Peel became the show's defining era. There was also a season with Linda Thorson and the mid-70s update The New Avengers with Joanna Lumley. But it's always been that Mrs. Emma Peel and John Steed pairing that sprung to mind whenever The Avengers was mentioned. Well, to anyone who didn't read Marvel comics. Talk of an Avengers feature had been around for years, but it wasn't until the late 1990s when Steed and Mrs. Peel finally hit the big screen, with all the verve of rotten vegetables hurled by irate audience members, like those who've just paid to see a stage magician, but instead they received a TEDx talk on why the audiences of magic shows are all gullible fools. In the Avengers, Project Prospero apparently has something to do with the weather, and it's the centre of a conspiracy by August de Winter to take control of the technology for his own ends. A government spy agency tasks John Steed to team up with a former member of Prospero, Mrs. Emma Peel, to find out what the hell's going on. Well, they could have saved us all some bother and read the last page of the screenplay, but instead we have 90 minutes of Sean Connery giving us some of his hammiest acting this side of a bacon commercial. It's so strange. Mrs. Peel is under suspicion, thanks to a doppelganger, which is like an identical twin, but way more dramatic sounding. I too have an evil twin, Dan Fine, who hosts a cooking show on another social media platform. Look, that doesn't sound all that evil, but you really should see what he does with ketchup, bananas, and oysters. You'll be allowed a privilege to prove your innocence. If you didn't blow up Prospero, find out who did. Mrs. Emma Peel is a recent widow driving a Jaguar E-Type, and John Steed, a bachelor who drives an old Bentley, but one that has a built-in tea vending machine. Yes, the dashboard of his car can deliver a constant supply of hot tea. Apparently having a reservoir of hot water in the dashboard of a car is totally not a hazard in a crash. The plot of this film is a jumbled load of set pieces, apparently connected by Eddie Izzard's henchman character running off at the end of every scene, while a music critic happily dispatches Sean Ryder. Steed's two superiors, mother and father, aren't the most communicative of department heads, and their working relationship is made all the more difficult by the fact father is working for De Winter. And well, if, if there's a point to the storyline in this film, it, like the entrance to Narnia, is well hidden. Is it worth trying to synopsize the plot more fully? No, not really. It just about holds up in amongst the surreal silliness, but it's about as appealing as a torn hamstring. <laughs> oh, that's smart. This is a silly movie. But it is based off a show that started off as a serious crime drama and peaked when it became a quirky and stylish slice of 60s weirdness. I mean weird, odd, unusual, and really goofy things happen in the Avengers series. 
In that regard, this movie does actually seem like somebody watched at least a few episodes of the television series and tried to ape badly much of its superficial style and update it in some areas. But the end result manages to alienate pretty much anyone who is unfortunate enough to buy a ticket to see this. So, superficially, there's a lot that compares with the series. I said, this is all terribly formal. Must I go on calling you Dr. Peel? No, no. Under the circumstances, you may call me Mrs. Peel. Much better. Ray finds an Uma Thurman maker decent John Steed and Emma Peel, though one where the semi-flirty banter between the two has been amped up and it's super hemi-demi-flirty here, with innuendos and double entendre thrown in for good measure. Too tight. Push. There's even <gasps> a kiss. Are the leads miscast? Well, I'd say they're decent enough. If you were looking for a classy, posh fellow in the late 90s, then Ray Fiennes was about as close to an ideal as it was available. In the late 90s, Fiennes was starting to blow up as an actor, though not literally since that would have curtailed his career somewhat. His rising star taught the world he was a guy that, although his name looked like Ralph, it was pronounced in a sort of traditional way, Rafe. Just like Rafe Loren, Rafe Waldo Emerson, and Happy Days Rafe Mafe. Yes, I looked it up, because researching the Ralph Rafe Ralph schism was far more interesting than thinking too hard on the Avengers. American Uma Thurman does a decent job with the accent, and has the physicality required for Emma Peel. Look, David Letterman already shot himself in the foot trying to mine comedy from Uma Thurman's name, so we'll leave that one alone. Thurman showed she could do a good job in action scenes, though it would be a few years before her greatest action hero role in Kill Bill. Do I walk like Mrs. Peel, talk like Mrs. Peel? Am I witty, wise, wonderful to know? Or do I go around shooting ministry agents attempting to rule the world on my days off? I'd give them both the passing grade for making the most of the material supplied. Like when you're asked to build a house out of fresh mud bricks during the monsoon season. Uh, maybe something more feminine. A woman's touch. That should do it. I think so. It's a bad script full of dialogue that's trying for playful banter, but instead feels like two rival comedians who are jealous of one another trying to one-up each other's jokes in order to win a spot as the quirky contestant on The Great British Bake Off. Cumulus. Yes. Stratocumulus. Oh, yes. <laughs> Nimbus. Uh, oh, I discovered that nothing beats a good lashing. Mind your head. Jim Broadbent is mother, hearkening back to Steed's boss in the final year of the original series. His offsider father, Fiona Shaw, who, like Broadbent, has been in lots of things, from Super Mario Brothers to Harry Potter, and more recently Andor. Comedian Eddie Izzard pops up and then often runs away after his colleagues are all killed. Also in a minor role is Keely Hawes, who a few years later in shows like Ashes to Ashes would prove to be the sort of British actress you'd think of as ideal casting for Mrs. Peel. The star of the original series, Patrick McNee, provides the voice for an invisible character. Don't worry about me being invisible. Other than that, I'm perfectly normal. Either that or he read the script and thought better than to appear on screen. I'm sorry to trouble you. It's obvious you know nothing. I know nothing? I have forgotten more than those fools at the ministry ever knew. Somebody who apparently read the script and had no problem with it, Sean Connery. Connery rarely played villains, and he at least seems to be having fun in his role as the comic book villain, and at least somebody had a good time with this film. Throughout the 1990s, Connery had sure made some uh, questionable choices when it came to what roles he took on. There's a philosophy in Hollywood, one for them, one for me, meaning alternating between taking jobs for money and jobs for artistic fulfillment. I'm not entirely sure that Connery had realized that that was an option. Oh, do shut up! Some drama properties that may have gained a reputation as being naive, cheesy or dated were often turned into comedies when it came time to remake them. The Avengers is not pitched as a comedy or a parody of 60s silliness because the cast play everything straight. This is meant to be a noisy late 90s action film. The problem was, this just feels like a less funny version of Austin Powers. Now, regardless of how you feel about Austin Powers, whether it's positive or negative, either way, this is just plain worse. Like ordering a ham and cheese panini for lunch and they give you jam and peas on a stale bap. The Avengers TV series had confident characters who also exuded charm. Here the main characters are not what you would call charming, but they are incredibly smug. Like somebody making an acceptance speech at the Academy Awards after they had previously given up on any chance of winning and had preemptively commiserated with a few lines in the bathroom beforehand. I feel I'm wasting my time. Please, please touch it. 
talk of an Avengers feature film or a revival of some description had bubbled away for decades. There had been early talks to make an Avengers film in the 60s, and there were various attempts to bring back the series one way or the other starting from the late 70s. But like trying to climb Mount Everest while wearing shorts and sandals, all attempts to proceed seemed frozen. The rights to the television series bounced between various hands before producer Jerry Weintraub acquired them and lost them, but he did retain the rights to a feature film version of The Avengers, which is where this film comes in. Jerry, you're killing me! Canadian director Jeremiah Chechik had directed Benny and June and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So to somebody, he seemed like a natural fit to direct an action film with a decent budget. After this film, Chechik would mainly work as a television director. There's no linkage. T? I know about the Prospero incident. Sugar, one lump. The script copped grief over its British stereotyping and the idea that, despite the film having a British writer, that it was pandering to American ideas of Britain. It is a bit silly, most of the people in this movie have very good teeth, but there's the obligatory Big Ben, red phone boxes, minis, double-decker buses, and of course, there's so much tea consumed that a longer cut of the film may have just consisted of people asking to use the lav. Literal toilet humour aside, this was a much longer film, but cut down to a reasonably tight yet still unreasonable 89-minute runtime. An 89-minute action film sounds like it could be a taut thriller, but in reality, it drags like Auntie Beryl clinging to the bar at closing time. There's something about a bad film that makes even a short runtime feel insufferable and a chore to get through. Cocky little bastard. Indeed. I remember this as one of the first movies I ever bought on DVD, and it took me three or four sessions to get through. In re-watching it after so long, I had less of a problem getting through it in one go, but it's such a waste of the cast, the source material, and everybody's time. Just a total waste of resources, like hiring Evil Knievel as a motorbike courier. I mean, he's fast and generally reliable, just so long as his deliveries don't take him anywhere near a bus station. An early, longer cut of the film was previewed with audiences, and the results were not encouraging. A bit like my chats with my career guidance counsellor in high school, you bastard. Warner Brothers wanted a tighter, shorter film. The shorter cut meant the original composer, Michael Kamen, walked away taking his in-progress score with him, and he was later replaced by Joel McNeely. McNeely's score is okay for this sort of film, but it's by no means the worst part of the finished product. Will you kindly allow me to continue? Steed, you were saying? I was saying, someone's recruiting your Prospero scientists under a cover organization. So, uh, let's look at some positives. Okay, well, the visuals are nice. The cinematography, the production design and visual effects for the most part are quite decent. Are they enough to overcome the feeling that you're wasting a perfectly good evening when you could be watching, oh, I don't know, anything else? Definitely not. As for other positives, anyway. In the Avengers series, they drank quite a bit of booze and indeed the upper class pretensions of later years meant champagne was often the tipple of choice. Champagne sounds far more digestible. Champagne, however, was not what Americans associated with Britain. I did it all! Steed having a tea maker built into his car that dispensed hot tea horrified some purists. More tea? No thanks. I meant me. It's capable of dispensing either lemon or milk. Now, it's probably UHT milk because somebody must be buying that stuff. Milk gets so, you know, unless it's UHT milk. But there's no demand for that because it's shite. The Avengers is a film that tries so hard to be quirky that it feels like every character has swallowed just enough helium to keep them a few inches off the ground. There's as much realism in this film as there is at a cubist exhibition. The Avengers series was pretty wacky in its later seasons, so why doesn't it work here? Maybe it's just a question of timing. Reboots and remakes of popular 60s shows had already begun in the 70s. Indeed, the Avengers had the new Avengers, which had tried to meld the goofiness of the late 60s with a slightly grittier 70s feel. Then in the late 90s, a slew of movies were released, all based on 60s TV. A 1996 film version of Mission Impossible did very well. The Saint, less so. Lost in Space, not so much. And Wild Wild West was not so much less so, but very much less so. The last three all lost money on paper. Of the big 60s screen adaptations, Avengers was the negative box office champ, losing money more effectively than investing in a company that makes boat anchors out of cork. Thank you, Mrs. Peter.
So is this Avengers film a waste of time, a complete waste of time, or an utter waste of time? Well, I'm um, still thinking. It's one of those films people forget just how bad it was. Yet I've always been surprised by universally panned media that some people like. Hey look, sometimes our reviews go against the grain and we try to find positives in trash. So who are we to criticize? In the case of the Avengers, trash is trash. Or in this case, to be more colloquially accurate, rubbish is rubbish. The Avengers is a load of rubbish. So much so that you could probably rename Bin Night to Avengers 1998 Night and almost no one who's seen the film would flinch. Sometimes inspiration hits you and sometimes it doesn't. This movie is what happens when inspiration takes a long sabbatical. I'm going to treat this film like the fateful incident that took place in the boathouse on the night of May 31, 1976 and pretend like it never happened. The 1998 version of The Avengers is not a hit and it's not even a near miss. Well, it's not a near miss unless you're Mr. Magoo training as a sniper. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.